depending, I'm gonna, we're gonna shift gears to what I think is the second most difficult problem in colorectal cancer, and that is how to manage metastatic disease that's resectable. So the role of chemotherapy, defining resectability, how, you know, where is the bar on that? Maybe give us a little bit of a high-level overview of how you, when you're seeing a new patient with metastatic colon, make an assessment of resectability or not, and a little bit about, you know, the role of chemotherapy from your perspective in this patient. Well, that's a, that's a very challenging question, uh, and this has to be uh, placed into a multidisciplinary team discussion. And I, I discuss with my surgeon, and for example, patients with liver metastasis, is this a, a resectable case? This is the information I do need first. Uh, and then we have to, 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 to go, if it's resectable, and I think it's a continuum of presentation. If we have somebody who has a small, single lesion in the liver that is clearly resectable, we would nowadays go for straight-on resection. Yeah. However, it's, if it's a, a patient who has a bit more tumor, let's say three or four lesions or large lesions, we would very strongly argue for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is, a, yes, I, I see people shaking here. <laughs> yeah. And this is... Uh, we'll discuss. We'll discuss. We'll discuss. We'll we will discuss. discuss. We're not beating up. We will discuss. Yet. No, no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's a very strong discussion that I have with my surgeon. You know, the, if you have a very good liver surgeon in your team, he will say, okay, it's easy to resect these three or four lesions. Uh, that, that should be the first approach here. But I very often argue in favor of uh, a neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this case. Maybe I stop here because... Uh, that, that Actually, was you're dying. Oh, I'm yeah. dying. You know, he's getting very nervous. No, 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 very, very okay, good. The floor no, is yours. no, so, so I mean, uh, I do agree that some patients who present with, let's say, solitary metastasis uh, need surgery, probably not even chemotherapy afterwards at all, or surgery and then chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, whatever. Um, but I do believe that we that it really depends on the time point of presentation, the context of presentation. For instance, just to give you an idea, I think there's a biologic difference where the patient presents in a stage four disease setting, synchronously metastasis, or a patient who had, let's say, stage two colon cancer four years ago and then pops up with a single metastasis, you yank it out and that's fine. Uh, we have a lot of biologic information about this patient. Now, in a setting where you have synchronous metastasis, I'm not afraid of the metastasis that I see. Mm -hmm. You can take care of them. I'm afraid of the ones that I don't see. And I do believe that early treatment of what we can say, I mean, this is, my, this is just my approach in the absence of data. Expert opinion, or whatever you say, le evidence level Emin six, oh. six, <laughs> yeah. six, no, whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, eminence, eminence based. Eminence based, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, is, is I like to get chemotherapy up front, um, even if this is a resectable disease, because I treat the potentially occult micrometastatic disease, which I don't address otherwise. And I had obtained biological information on this patient. So um, I, do, I do believe if we can just separate out the different s settings, you know. And I, I see, for instance, the ESMO guidelines. They are very resistant to obtain, to give chemotherapy in the context of easily resectable liver metastasis. Uh, but this is, this a, is a, a, completely, a completely agree. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the cases I was referring to were those who have uh, metachronous metastasis, let's say two years, three years after resection of primary, then a small lesion. Yeah. And we know from the Fong score, for example, that there are certain parameters that tell us, you know, even though we have an R0 resection, the patient has a high uh, chance of having recurrence. I I'm completely with you. This is why I meant there's a continuum of presentation, and we have to take all these risks into consideration when we choose this treatment. But Heinz, our, our strategy has been over the years to uh, give some chemo around the time of these METs. And so even yeah. patients who had, say, adjuvant full FOX, then have a MET, we'd give adjuvant full theory and often include BEV and other biologics. Mm -hmm. We have one study that tries to address this, the URCCT mm -hmm. study, yes. the Nordlinger study. Mm -hmm. um, give us a little thought about your thinking of quote unquote, are we giving adjuvant therapy yeah. or are we treating metastatic disease? So, so we're going again from one expert opinion to another yeah. one. Um, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think what we, the bigger picture is that I think colon cancer, which is metastatic, is curable. Now we can talk about the chances for that, but this is not true for many other diseases. You would we know in breast cancer, lung cancer, that's not. So there is a certainly unique window because of the pattern of development metastases and the access to surgery. So that's very important for the paradigm of approaching it. I agree with Axel, I like the biology. Now, you can do biology by understanding the molecular testing on the tumor, or you can actually see when you do chemo, even in the smaller lesions, 
Will this treatment work? Now, when you, in your case, you mentioned fall fox adjuvant and you have a three or four centimeter lesion, I'm a, I agree, your, your enemy is not what you see, what you don't see. And when you then give full theory, with the target agents or not, based on the molecular testing, I use the same treatment afterwards. So I have no problem. I think adjuvant after metastectomy is not really the same adjuvant. So do you think in a patient who's responding, say, with full theory BEV mm -hmm. in the neoadjuvant yes. setting, do you then think that that's enough of a signal to overcome the negative adjuvant for yes, theory data? Yes, because it's not the same. You treat systemic disease, which is resected, not local. But when, the, the, the PETAX3 data were not really negative. Yeah. They were not really positive. That's, that's <laughs> the difference. Yeah, there was a slight benefit. being fulfiry adjuvant. Uh, fulfiry no, adjuvant, you know, yeah. they were not really positive as uh, Fulfox was positive. But the magnitude but of benefit was quite small, of course, even if you tease sure. it out. Sure, uh, sure. But there to was this, a small one. What is adjuvant? Is a micrometastatic disease different than an established tumor, yeah. one that's grown roots? Seeds versus one that's grown roots, language that I use in clinic a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really struggle with but that you know, concept. When you think about it um, in the recurrence where we failed basically, the Ivinotecan basically nothing, Bevacuzumab nothing, Cetuximab nothing, because I think these are dormant cells. They're not waking up, they're not being chemosensitive. If that process has stepped to the level where you have visible disease, we are your beyond, okay? And when you look for the BEF adjuvant, the N2 lesions were beneficial. So I think this is a different disease where you treat, and I think I would then do, with, in the absence of data. So, That's what I'm so Johanna, should we be giving BEV2 progression in this patient, second. right? So this is a patient, let's give him two or three METs, all right? that are resected, okay, give them some neoadjuvant, fine, they respond. This patient still has, what would you quote, 80%, 60%, some, a high 80, number yes. for relapse, right? So should this patient be treated in the adjuvant setting or to progression? What do you think? Ha ha, expert opinion again. <laughs> That's what I'm after. Um, so, so should we put BEV in the water of our metastatic patients hmm. that no. have been resected? And, and I think this is an important question because the thought was, potentially when we looked at the CO8 data, are we preventing the angiogenic switch from happening by giving continuous bevacizumab? That also being said, we also potentially have cured some patients that we've done the metastatectomy in. So then we're treating patients that may be cured with bevacizumab, a very expensive therapy where we're data-free regimens. So what I tend to recommend to my physicians, and I get asked this a lot, now that I've completed my six months of adjuvant treatment in the metastatic setting, what should I do? Because they're afraid to stop. Mm -hmm. What they're looking for me to say and what I do to say to them is stop. Mm -hmm. You stop, let the patients go, and let's see what happens. Because truly, if they did have micrometastatic disease that the bevacizumab was keeping under wraps, they're going to recur eventually. But so over there in the breast cancer clinic, they're giving tamoxifen forever for mm -hmm. the same reason, right? Mm -hmm. They don't stop, mm -hmm. they go for 10 years. I mean, why aren't we embracing this kind of approach? Is it cost, is it risk, is it we don't have enough data to support doing it? Here you go. I think it's, I think it's the lack of data. And yeah. you heard a lot about kind of uh, expert opinion, you know, as, as level of evidence here. And I actually do believe, I mean, we all have the challenge of these patients, you know, you know 80% recurrence. We like to cure, but we cure the minority. We have a high risk of recurrence. So I do believe this would actually be an amazing, uh, really important field to study. This is in the patient population, just because these are relevant questions. Yeah. Why not put this patient on Cape Sideway? Forever. For, forever, you know, like the oral, to get the IV problems and perhaps so out of the way. Now, Keep side is not the easiest drug uh, for It is most the way I do so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then we're probably in agreement on how to do it. But yeah, it's, so we, I think this is exactly where we need trials, yeah. to get out of well, the expert opinion. Well, you are in charge of trials. Why don't you go out there and run these there trials? There are trials being yeah, developed okay. right now. I think now. a lot of people yeah. work on it. been planned. Very but good. I wanted yeah. to b b jump into this resectability because I don't want to give the impression to our listeners that when the tumor recurs, we did maybe something not right or we should have not done it. Yeah. I think there are clear data with the curative dent surgery, these patients live significantly longer with the surgery even when it recurs. So I think I don't want to get the impression maybe we should have not done it. I think we still have to do that. We have to figure out better treatments to prevent recurrence but this is the right way on the path of curing more patients. Yeah, that cleared that up. We have five experts up here, and I think I heard six different opinions <laughs> on, on how to deal with that. Well, let's get to something that I think we, we agree on a little bit more, and that's once you've finished with your adjuvant stage two, three, or your NED stage four, how do you follow those patients? What's the German standard? The German standard is 
uh, every, in the first two years, every three months, we see those patients, do a physical examination, uh, uh, take a history, of course, and do an ultrasound of the liver and uh, draw uh, blood for CAA testing. Yeah? And thereafter, three months? Three, every three for months. For how long? For how long? For two years. Two years. And thereafter, it's every, half, uh, every six months. Six months, yeah. And then uh, this is going on until five years. Now, this is not really based on randomized trials. There is some retrospective data uh, on over 6,000 patients that tells us, yes, CAA, ultrasound are the most important uh, things to do. Obviously, we also discuss uh, colonoscopies uh, in, in several um, uh, um, uh, <coughs> intervals, uh, but this is the way we do it. It's, um, yeah. Johanna, what's the Nashville? Uh, what I tend to do in general is, is do a CT scan, physical exam, CEA labs every three months, first two years, six months, next two years, and yearly. Now, it's overdoing it potentially um, um, compared to what the recommendations are. But then I also think that we have to take into account what we were just discussing, is that when patients recur with metastatic disease, there's a percentage of them that we can cure. And so that's why I tend to be pretty aggressive about my surveillance, just because if I'm going to catch it, I want to catch it early when I get them in the best chance of potentially being cured again. Yeah. 